This is the second day of this September 2023 seven day session. And we're going to continue with exploring the teachings of early Chan masters. And I'll be using the same two texts as yesterday. Andy Ferguson's Zen's Chinese Heritage and Thomas Cleary's Zen Essence. Yesterday, we read from the teachings of Yuan Wu. And today, we'll look at another master of the Song Dynasty, Foyan, who, like Yuan Wu, was a disciple of Wu Zhu. Foyan's years are 1067 to 1120. And Ferguson says, he came from a city near the modern city of Shangdu in Sichuan province. He is one of three illustrious students of Wu Tzu, who were known as the Three Buddhas. And there's a, a footnote that says Yuan Wu and Foyan are two of the three. And then the third is Foyan. Hard to say. Uh, Ferguson goes on to recount a story, though, from Foyan's early years. He says, at the age of 14, <clears throat> Foyan accepted the Buddhist precepts. He then proceeded to study the Buddhist scriptures and practice the tenets of the Vinaya. In the Lotus Sutra, he read a passage that said, It is the Dharma that cannot be discerned by thinking that can be attained. It is the Dharma that cannot be discerned by thinking that can be attained. He asked his Vinaya teacher, teacher for an explanation of the passage, but received no answer. Foyan sighed and said, Doctrinal study can't resolve the great matter of life and death. So this echoes what Yuan Wu's early experiences were in relying on the study and recitation of sutras. We cannot resolve the great matter through words. And that's why we're here in Sashin doing this vital work. Foyan then traveled south and began training at the Dharma seat of a Zen master named Master Yan. One day, as he was begging for alms during a rainstorm, Foyan slipped and fell to the ground. In the midst of this predicament, he overheard two men arguing fiercely nearby. One of them said, you're still defiling yourself. And at these words, Foyan had an insight. He returned to the temple to question Master Yan about it. But Yan would only say, I'm not you. You can do it yourself. Or, I don't understand. I can't compare to you. This merely increased Foyan's uncertainty. So he went to the head monk and tried to pose his question. And 
by the way, I'm, I'm taking some liberty here in not specifying all the individual people's names that appear in the story. Um, it makes it kind of difficult to follow along. So again, Foyan went to the head monk for help with understanding this insight he said he had upon hearing an argument between two men with the one guy yelling aloud, you're still defiling yourself. And it's, it's difficult to read between the lines here because there aren't any other details. But as the story continues, it is clear that Foyan was caught up in playing over in his mind this exchange that he had overheard. The head monk responded by grabbing Foyan's ear and pulling him in a circle around the stove, saying, You already understand. But Foyan demanded, I wanted you to help me. Why are you playing a game? The head monk said, Later, You'll be enlightened, and then you'll know why today's song bends your ears. So what was the head monk indicating by grabbing and dragging Foyan by the ear? What might seem like a crazy antic, a game from one point, is actually a teaching tool from another. Perhaps the head monk intuited that the only way to get Foyan out of his head to stop wasting his time ruminating was to grab him by the ears. But at the time, Foyan wasn't ready to understand the head monk's actions. And as the story continues, one cold night, as he sat up alone, Foyan poked deep in the ashes of a dwindled fire and saw the embers flare up. He suddenly exclaimed, Poke deeply and you'll find it. Life is like this. And then next, Foyan picked up and read some lamp records about a former teacher. And then... Suddenly, he penetrated the bottom of the stove. In other words, in an instant, he opened up. He saw things simply as they are. Life is like this. And notice that he was doing an ordinary chore at the time. He was simply tending to the fire on a cold night. Could have been any chore, though. He could have been mopping the floor, preparing a meal, or setting the table. Foyan then composed a verse. In the forest of knives, a bird sings out.
wrapped in a cloak and sitting up late, poking the fire and awakening to ordinary life. The great gods are overturned and smashed. In the glistening world are the self-deluded. Who will sing a colorless song? Realized once, it is not forgotten. The gate is open, but few pass through it. To say that the gate is open, but few pass through it, is to say that our our true nature is hiding in plain sight. It's completely ordinary. It's this, right here. And yet we think it's got to be something momentous. And because we're thinking that, we don't see that the gate is wide open. It's been open all along. And as for Foyan, he would go on to become one of the great Chan masters in the Linji school. A couple of paragraphs later, there's a passage taken from the text, The Record of the Venerable Ancients. And it's a famous Zen story about two types of sickness. <clears throat> Foyan said, I say there are but two types of sickness. One is to ride a donkey to look for the donkey. One is to ride a donkey to look for the donkey. The other is riding the donkey and not letting yourself get off it. Don't you see that riding a donkey to find a donkey is a fatal disease? This old mountain monk is telling you, don't seek it. Clever people understand right where they are. They give up the seeking disease and the crazy thought-pursuing mind. So the first kind of sickness is attachment to attainment or goal-seeking. Riding a donkey while looking for a donkey is seeking enlightenment by looking outside yourself. Not realizing that it's not other than who you are. You're already a donkey. We try so hard. We put so much exertion into our practice. Not aware that we're straining that we're trying to get something, trying to make something happen. Try not trying instead. Try just being. Being as you are in this one moment. 
that doesn't mean we should sit here passively and allow ourselves to drift off into thoughts. We still need to actively give, give our attention to our practice. But at the same time, relax into the moment. Relax into our body. If we have tension in our body, it shows up as tension in our mind and vice versa. Then Foyan says, once you've seen the donkey not allowing yourself to get off, now that's most hard to cure. This old mountain monk is telling you, don't ride it. So the second kind of sickness is an, an attachment to enlightenment as an experience. And it, it's another form of dwelling on attainment. When, once you've had any kind of insight, whatever it is, it's over, gone. What use is it to live in the past? Foyan continues, You are the donkey. The great earth is the donkey. How are you going to ride it? If you continue to ride it, you'll never cure this disease. If you don't ride it, then all the worlds in the ten directions are open to you. If you can get rid of both of these diseases at once, then there's nothing left in your mind and you're a person of the way. What could trouble you? So the cure to these two sicknesses is not to seek and not to dwell. Just be present here. And here, and here, there's another passage from Foyan. <clears throat> And it gets at another way in which we cling to duality, and that's creating imaginary dramas. <clears throat> Foyan says, have you heard the old story of the Vinaya monk? He upheld all the precepts all of his life. When he was walking at night, he stepped on something that made a loud noise. He thought it was a toad. And inside of this toad were countless toad eggs. The monk was scared out of his wits and passed out from fright. He dreamed that hundreds of toads were coming after him, demanding their lives. The monk was utterly terrified. When dawn came around, he saw that he had just stepped on, wait for it, a dried out eggplant. The monk, realizing the unreliable, 
the unreliable nature of his thoughts, then ceased such thinking and realized the empty nature of the three realms. And after this, he could begin doing genuine practice. And then Foyan says, Now I ask you all, was the thing the monk stepped on in the night a toad, or was it an eggplant? And if it was an eggplant, there still seemed to be toads who demanded their lives. Have you rid yourself of these visions? I'll check to see if you understand. If you've gotten rid of the fear of the toads, do you still have the eggplant there? You must have no eggplant either. This story captures the oneness of mind and world. There's no world outside of mind. Mind is all that we are, all that we experience. Things are things because of mind, as mind is mind because of things. I'm now going to shift to the other text, Zen Essence, this uh, edited collection by Thomas Cleary that includes uh, translations of, of Foyan, among other Zen masters. The first one is titled Inherent Zen. Foyan says, Why do you not understand your nature when it is inherently there? There is not much to Buddhism, or we can say there is not much to practice. It just requires getting to the essential. We do not teach you to annihilate random thoughts, suppress body and mind, shut your eyes and say, this is Zen. Zen is not like this. You should observe your present state. It's true, there's not much to practice. It's incredibly simple. Just keep returning our attention back to our practice over and over. And in doing that, we're not shutting out the world or rejecting our thoughts. Everything is mind. In another blurb, Foyan says, you should step back and investigate. How do you step back? It is not a matter of sitting there, ignoring everything, stiffly repressing 
body and mind so that they are like earth or wood. That will never do any good. In other words, we're not trying to become robots devoid of feeling and sensation. Practice makes us alive. in tune with what we're experiencing. Just through this simple method of giving our attention to Mu, who This it or, or whatever practice we're working on. This next segment is titled, Just You. An ancient Zen master, seeing a monk go down a staircase, called to him, Reverend. This this title, Reverend, is like uh, the equivalent of Venerable referring to a to an ordained monastic so an ancient zen master seeing a monk go down a staircase called to him reverend the monk turned around and then the zen master said from birth to old age it's just you Why turn your head and revolve your brains? From birth to old age, it's just you. Tell me who is this? As soon as you arouse the intention of seeing who you are, you don't see yourself. It is hard to see yourself. Very difficult. It's like a donkey seeking a donkey or a human trying to become a human. Why don't we see it? When we hear there's just the sound. In and of itself. But who's hearing it? Well, there's a person over here who has ears, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. What about that? Yes, we have a body. And our senses are 
windows into the world. But can we say that there's a little person inside that stands apart from what it perceives? Foyan says, as soon as you arouse the intention of seeing who you are, you don't see yourself. As soon as you arouse the intention of seeing who you are, you don't see yourself. So when there's no intention, no purpose, no aim in seeing, there's just seeing, hearing, just hearing, tasting, just tasting. Direct experience beyond words this next one is titled fixation The minute you fixate on the recognition that this is it, you are immediately bound hand and foot and cannot move around anymore. It's like making a boat and outfitting it for a thousand mile journey to a treasure trove. If you drive a stake and tie the boat to it, before you jump into the boat and start rowing, you can row till kingdom come and will still be on the beach. You see the boat waving this way and that, and you think you are on the move, but you've never gone a single step. This analogy really brings to life being stuck in thoughts about progress. We're wanting to row far out into sea, into the open waters where we think we'll find peace and tranquility. But we're grasping to get there. We've got the boat tied up to the shore. It reminds me of a, a parable I read about. And I, I don't know the source of it. But there's this guy who's standing on the edge of a lake and he calls out to someone who's on the opposite side of the lake and he says hey how do I get to the other shore and the guy on the other side of the lake said in response you are the other shore And here's another one titled Misapplication. 
Foyan says, Zen is an easily understood practice that saves energy. But people cause themselves pains. The ancients saw people helpless and told them to try meditating quietly. This was good advice, but later people didn't understand what the ancients meant and closed their eyes, suppressed body and mind, and sat like lumps waiting for enlightenment. How foolish. In Sashin, the more zazen we do, the more energy we have. It accumulates with with each passing day, despite any temporary tiredness we might feel. It passes. And we might start off Sashin with a hailstorm of thoughts. But as we continue to devote ourselves to our practice, returning to it over and over, thoughts do lose their hold on us. And we expend much less energy as a consequence. But we have to do this work. Can't dodge it. Can't maneuver around. We have to trust the process. And ourselves. Here's another one, misperception. Suppose a bit of filth gets stuck to a man's nose while he is sleeping. When he awakens, unaware of what has happened, he may notice an odor and start smelling his shirt. Thinking his shirt stinks, he takes it off. But then whatever he picks up smells bad to him. He doesn't realize the smell is on his nose. Someone tells him, but he doesn't believe it. Told to wipe his nose, he refuses. He'll realize sooner if he wipes off his nose, but when he eventually washes his face, he'll find there's no order. Then he'll find when he smells things, that they, that they do not stink after all. Zen practice is like this. Those who will not stop and look into themselves go on looking for intellectual understanding. That pursuit of intellectual understanding, seeking rationalizations, and making comparisons is all wrong. If people would turn their attention back to the self, they would understand everything. And of course, when he says, turn your attention back to the self, he's saying, back to your practice. You are not other than mu, who, what, it, the breath. It's who you are.
This next one is titled Transcending Subject and Object. Those who realize Zen enlightenment transcend subject and object. There is no other mysterious principle besides this. In the course of ordinary daily activities, when you see colors, it is a time of realization. And when you hear sounds, it is a time of realization. When you eat and drink, this too is a time of realization. This means all these are times of realization when you transcend subject and object in everything. This is not a matter of long practice and doesn't need cultivation. It's right here. So it is said, only with experiential realization do you know the unfathomable. Our true nature is available, accessible to us each and every moment simply by giving our attention to this one moment and recognizing that each moment is a new one. Just look. Just listen. Give it your bare attention. Each moment is a lifetime. And that's why Foyan says realizing our true nature is not a matter of long practice nor short practice. It comes down to where Our mind is in this one moment, here. The American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson put it this way. Finish each day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. You shall begin it serenely and with too high a spirit to be encumbered with your old nonsense. In Zen terms, we can say, finish each moment and be done with it. You've done what you could. Some thoughts and judgments undoubtedly crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. This one moment is a new one.
We'll stop here and recite the four vows.